I thought I was going to have to call for silence before uh, an evening devoted to noise, but I'm glad uh, uh, convention clearly dictates. So, um, a very warm welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Russell Goldborn. I'm a professor of French literature and dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at King's, and it gives me great pleasure to just say uh, a few words at the start of this evening's proceedings. Uh, a few practicalities. First, there will be no questions after the lecture. There will, however, uh, perhaps even more interestingly and alluringly, be refreshments upstairs. Um, so don't let the bubbles go cold. They'll be waiting for you in chapters, um, just a floor above here. Everybody is very warmly invited to, to come to that reception afterwards. It's a particular pleasure to welcome um, family, friends, former and present colleagues and students of tonight's lecturer. Inaugurals are very powerful events, powerful events at which one finds out, I think, quite a bit about a person one thought one knew already quite well. They're very personal moments where you find out what really matters to somebody, what matters to somebody in terms of their work, but also who matters to that person who the key supporters are, who the key influencers are in that person's work and life. And I think tonight will be no exception, because I think one of the key figures, uh, one of the key influencers, is Professor Laura Marcus, to who I'm going to hand over in a moment. Professor Marcus is Goldsmith's Professor of English Literature at the <coughs> University of Oxford, and she originally uh, examined the PhD thesis of tonight's speaker. I'm sure there are many other connections too. At the end of the lecture, Professor Marcus will give the vote of thanks, but she's also going to say a few words of introduction now. So please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Marcus. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to see everybody here tonight, many old friends. Um, I, actually, I've got rather more than a few words, but I won't take up the time because you want to hear Anna. And it's a great honour and pleasure to be introducing Professor Anna Snaes on the occasion of her inaugural lecture this evening. As uh, Russell pointed out, I've, um, I was uh, Anna's uh, University of London examiner. I've known her for 20 years, and I can date it very precisely to July 1996, which was her Viva date. Um, when I examined her doctoral thesis on Virginia Woolf. Anna was a doctoral student at UCL, working with Professor David Trotter after a stellar undergraduate career at the University of Toronto. I recall the Viva and Anna during it very vividly. I remember, in addition to the excellence of the thesis and the quality of her responses to our questions, that she had on a smart suit and that her hair was gathered up and that in her early 20s she seemed rather more soigné and composed than her examiners. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> since then we've become not only fellow researchers in Wolf and Modernist Studies but firm friends. I've seen Anna let her hair down metaphorically as well as literally, but she's always retained the professionalism and intellectual focus as well as the utmost commitment to all aspects of academic life which have deservedly earned her a chair at King's College London at an early stage in her career. Now, a revised version of Anna's thesis was published in 2000 as Virginia Woolf, Public and Private Negotiations. This was a major contribution to Woolf studies and formative of new directions in the field, including an in increased focus on Woolf as a public intellectual. Amongst the many wonderful insights and explorations in that book are chapters on Woolf's narrative strategies and on the reading public respondents to Three Guineas. Wolfe in her polemical work of the late 1930s, Three Guineas, which is a response to the question, how should women prevent war, addresses her text to the daughters of educated men. Anna's archival research shows us that however Wolfe had conceived of her readership, it was in fact made up of a variety of constituents, and that a number of these, men and women, working and middle class, wrote to Wolfe to express their opinions of her arguments. Many of their letters were answered by Wolfe, this is, as Anna's work on Wolfe has shown throughout, a Virginia Woolf firmly in the world and not withdrawn from it, as misinterpretations of her life and work have so often claimed. In addition to the Three Guineas letters, Anna's research has given us new knowledge 
of Wolf's contribution to the Marsham Street Library, subsequently the Fawcett Library, and in collaboration with Dr. Christine Kenyon-Jones of Wolf's own academic studies at King's College. This is a fascinating and surprising discovery, showing that Wolf, who always insisted that, by contrast with her public school and Cambridge-educated brothers, she had no formal education, in fact took courses in the 1890s, along with her sister, Vanessa Bell, in the King's College Ladies' Department. Over nearly five years, she studied English and continental history, German, Greek, and Latin. This discovery in the KCL archives, which has been instrumental in the naming of the KCL English Department building as the Virginia Woolf Building, is an exceptionally important contribution not only to Woolf's biography, but also to our broad understanding of women and education in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It seems particularly fitting that this research should have been undertaken in KCL's own archives, the institution to which Anna has shown the greatest commitment and where I know her to be the best of teachers, supervisors, and colleagues. From the time of her appointment as a lecturer in 2003, a position she took up after six very active and productive years at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. Anna's work on Wolfe's manuscripts have also led to her superb edition of Wolfe's novel, The Years, for the Cambridge edition of the works of Virginia Woolf. The edition, published in 2012, is an exceptional work of scholarship, the product of years of archival research. The co composition and publication history of the years is the most complex of all Wolfe's novels, and Anna has done it full justice. The edition will set the standard for Wolfe and modernist scholarship for years to come. It was described in a review in the Times Literary Supplement as, quote, quite simply, an astonishing editorial achievement. Now, I don't have time to list the numerous edited volumes, co-edited, uh, some with some people here, uh, chapters, essays, and articles which Anna has produced on Wolf and on many other aspects of modernist literature and culture. But I will just mention her long-standing commitment to the in work of the International Virginia Wolf Society, in which over the years she played starring roles in a number of the theatrical productions with which the annual conferences culminate. I turn now, in closing, to Anna's work on modernism and colonial post-colonial literatures. Her long-standing concern with questions of space, place, and urban experience contributed to her recently published study of empire, modernism, and women's writing, Modernist Voyages, Colonial Women Writers in London, 1890 to 1945, shortlisted for the Modernist Studies Association Book Prize in 2015. The book gives new dimensions to work on modernist writers and extends our understanding of the complex identities which compose metropolitan modernism. There's been surprisingly little work to date on the responses of colonial women writers to London as metropolis and imperial center. Anna's studies enables a rethinking of traditional concepts of centers and peripheries, as well as showing how definitions of literary and cultural modernism open up to broader geographical, historical, and political issues. It is a major contribution to modernist and post-colonial studies. The question of modernist sound and noise and of the auditory imagination has been the central focus of Anna's research in recent years. And it's been gratifying to read about the current collaborative project in which she's involved through the Arts and Humanities Research Institute at KCL, the World Service Project, which will explore the history of the BBC World Service and its tenure at Bush House, now part of King's. In 2009, Anna was the keynote speaker at the International Virginia Woolf Conference held that year in Fordham University, New York. She gave a brilliant lecture on the soundscapes of the years which she was then editing. I know we're all looking forward greatly to hearing her inaugural lecture this evening on the art of noise, interwar modernism, and the politics of sound. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, so much for that generous introduction. I knew when I booked in this event, I believe it or not, two years ago, um, I knew right away who I wanted to ask to introduce me and to bookend the lecture, as it were. And it gives me a chance to thank Laura publicly for all the support and guidance that she's given me since examining the PhD back in the 90s. It means so much to share the stage with you. 
I also want to thank my colleague Max Saunders, uh, Director of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute, and Pelagia and Daniel for all their hard work in preparing for this evening. I'm honoured to be giving the lecture as part of the Arts and Humanities Festival with its theme, Play. So my topic tonight is Modernism and Noise, and our first stop is Franz Kafka's story, The Burrow, a tale of noise obsession. The protagonist, maybe a mole or a badger, has painstakingly constructed a subterranean network of tunnels when he is disturbed by an unfamiliar and threatening noise. He becomes fixated on locating his source. Kafka describes his predicament in this passage. Wherever I listen, high or low, at the walls or the floor, at the entrances or in the center of the chamber, I hear the same noise. I get no closer to the source of the noise. It just goes on unchanged on the same thin note with regular pauses, now like a whistle, now more like a piping. Kafka represents the power of noise to take hold and the listener's determination to make meaning out of acousmatic sound, that is, sound cut off from the sight of its source. But this is also a story about the creative process and sonic interruption. The creature's meticulous construction of his burrow is a metaphor for artistic creation and draws on conventional images of reading or writing as a silent or solitary endeavor. It recalls the attempts of writers such as Thomas Carlyle, here in his study, or Marcel Proust to create soundproof writing rooms which are untroubled by the urban cacophony outside. But as Carlyle discovered, like the composer John Cage after him, noise invariably, sorry, attempts to exclude external noise invariably amplify internal sounds. In the burrow, the creature becomes unsure whether he in fact is creating the noise through his own burrowing or the sound of his pumping blood. The tunnels suggest the mind or the, even the labyrinthine ear itself, and the story prompts us to ask what it means to write noise, to write in noise, to write in the world. Like many an anti-noiseite, Kafka was an acoustically orientated writer whose stories are noisescapes ever open to mechanical, natural, and bodily sounds. In this lecture too, I too want to follow the noise. I want to tune into its complex frequencies and consider how writers in the first half of the 20th century represented urban sound. More specifically, I want to think about a particular moment in interwar Britain when noise became a pervasive subject of study and representation. Practitioners working across a range of disciplines like the creative arts, medicine, acoustics, and experimental psychology attempted to define, measure, interrogate, listen into, and legislate against noise. Aldous Huxley called this period the age of noise, and 1933 saw the founding of the Anti-Noise League, later the Noise Abatement League, an organization which sought to legislate against and to raise public awareness about the effects of noise. Many writers of the period were involved with the Noise Abatement League. Huxley, H.G. Wells, Rebecca West, J.B. Priestley, and wrote for their magazine entitled Quiet. <laughs> In its pages, noise is discussed as a real acoustic phenomenon, but is also the focal point for a number of other anxieties to do more generally with technology and the impact of urban life on the human body. One of the intriguing things about noise is the slipperiness of its definition. Think of your own sonic preferences and what counts as noise in your own personal sound world. The designation of sound as noise relies on context or the capacity of sound to distract and disrupt in some environments and not others. As one critic has suggested, noise is not a type of sound, but an orientation towards sound. But this makes narratives about noise all the more illuminating in relation to the preoccupations of a particular age. The rise of media and communication studies brought about attempts to define noise in more objective terms. In the late 40s, for example, Claude Shannon and Warren Weaver devised a theory of communication in which noise was classified as that which interrupts the transmitted signal 
or message. In their formulation, they distinguish between uncertainty or complexity introduced by the sender, which was desirable because it um, meant more information, and undesirable disruption caused by noise. So noise becomes a way of thinking about information or communication systems. It is often a sonic metaphor for information overload or multiplicity. And we might think of our own altered soundscape of sonic notification, the bleeps and chirps, buzzes of mobile technology, not to mention the metaphoric digital noise. It's associated then with nonsense, with waste, excess, whether excessive volume or the background hum of the machine, a sonic byproduct, if you like. Noise is also about newness or strangeness. When we have learned to hear a particular sound, to give it pattern or meaning, it ceases to be noise. To quote the composer John Cage, wherever we are, what we hear is mostly noise. When we ignore it, it disturbs us. When we listen to it, we find it fascinating. Noise can be a reassuring alternative to the terror of complete silence. In the vibration of matter, we reach beyond human audibility to noise as cosmic hum. In the context of the festival theme, noise is the acoustic sign of play and sociability. But let's leave that until later in the evening. For now, we'll reel back to the 1930s when the language of noise was a language of shock and discord. In the avalanche of books on noise published in the 1930s, medics, physicists, and acousticians attempted to define the term, whether as unwanted or anarchical sound, or via definitions that emphasize its non-musical or physical properties. Writers use adjectives like non-periodic, irregular or unbalanced to describe the din. In a decade characterized by political and economic crisis, that uncertainty had an oral register, but scholars have been slower to hear the sonic preoccupations of interwar Britain. It's no coincidence, too, that this was the period in which it was possible to measure noise with a greater degree of objectivity, thanks to a unit, the decibel, and instruments, noise meters that didn't rely on the operator's hearing. Although the new audiometers were extremely unwieldy to move, <laughs> they were immediately put into use for the creation of sound maps and charts by the noise abaters. Here's a, one from New York, 1930, but particularly compelling visually, I think. In 1886, Thomas Barr had conducted the first experiments into the effects of industrial noise on Glaswegian boilermakers. But then it was not until the 1920s that the effects of noise on the body became a serious subject of scientific inquiry. One experiment required participants to swallow a balloon in order to measure human response to pistol fire. Another involved typists, a noise machine, and the measurement of energy expenditure through breath. The downside was that the participants had to sleep in these masks for nine months so as to neutralize the discomfort. In earlier decades and centuries, narratives of acoustic sensitivity were distinctly class-bound. The more refined or artistic a person, the more sensitive. But in the interwar period, this ostensibly gave way to a broader concern about the detrimental effects of everyday urban sound on the national and individual body. In effect, noise became a public health issue. This interest in the material impact of invisible sound waves led to calls for the regulation and reduction of the din. Acoustic civilization was the phrase used by the Noise Abatement League. In the 1930s then, noise became shorthand for the perceived dangers of an increasingly mechanized and technological modern world. In the book City of Din, a tirade against noise, one of the many volumes published on noise in the period, the Dr. Dan McKenzie wrote, civilization is noise, at least modern civilization is, and the more it progresses, the noisier it becomes. The project of taming the man-made acoustical medley is a vast enterprise that requires the cooperation of the whole nation, urged Norman McLaughlin in yet another book called Noise, a Comprehensive Survey from Every Point of View. 
This is also the period, though, when across the arts, noise generated creative and conceptual energies. Many modernist artists were, to put it crudely, noisemakers. This can be heard in the use of mechanical sound, sirens or foghorns in art music, or the experimental sound poetry of writers like Kurt Schwitters or Gertrude Stein, which complicates and plays with the relationship between the sonic patterning of words and their meanings. Stein's phrase, nothing is noisy, suggests a receptivity to acoustic nonsense. T.S. Eliot used the phrase, the auditory imagination, a coinage which encapsulates his own practice as well as my interest this evening. His poem, The Wasteland, can be understood as a sound collage. In the poem, eyes and voices break down. You may remember the phrase from Burial of the Dead, I could not speak and my eyes failed. However, ears, though described as dirty, seem hyper alert to noises, the sounds of horns and motors, the wind, bird song, the clash and chatter that spills out of London's pubs, and the murmur of maternal lamentation. Modernists sought to capture and represent an ever-widening array of sounds, those created, amplified, and recorded by the increasingly popular sound technologies. The modernist propensity for listening in to noise is nowhere more evident than the work in the work of Italian futurist Luigi Russolo, who was a poet, artist, and composer who built instruments known as noise intoners that emulated a range of mechanical and natural sounds. He had, as in this picture, a howler, a rumbler, a crackler. Russolo was inspired by the onomatopoeic noise poetry of fellow futurist F.T. Marinetti, poetry that emerged from the battlefields of the First Balkan War and glorified the cacophony of military violence. And here the cover of Marinetti's Zang Tum Tum, and you can see how this goes hand in hand with typographical experiments and this sort of aesthetics of auditory and visual assault. In Russolo's manifesto, The Art of Noises, he proclaims, let us cross a large modern capital with our ears more sensitive than our eyes. We will delight in the muttering of motors, the throbbing of valves, the bustle of pistons, the shrieks of mechanical saws. Music then should break out of this limited circle of sounds and conquer the infinite variety of noise sounds. He gave a series of performances of his compositions, including at the London Coliseum in 1914 uh, with a rather bemused house orchestra. Uh, and without any amplif amplification, he only uh, had megaphones. So now I'll just play you a brief sound clip, it's only 28 seconds long, um, of one of his compositions, Awakening of a City. And this is one of the few original recordings uh, that remain. Ironically, unlike you, the audience could hardly hear, and the performance was met with, according to one reviewer, a vast, deep, long, sustained boo and cries of no more. <laughs> Literary modernism is often described in relation to a crisis of the senses. Modernist writers expanded and experimented with the ways a seemingly silent literary text might represent sound. A bit like a transducer, such as a microphone or loudspeaker that converts electrical signals into sound, Many modernist writers converted acoustic signals into black marks on the page. They were ever alert to the sound-bearing capacity of language. We can see this in the inclusion of song lyrics, staves of music. It's from Hope Mirlees' poem, Paris, um, an extract from Handel's Rinaldo, as well as in the use of onomatopoeia or phonetic representation. Written language bears and anticipates the rhythms and sounds of the spoken. So the literary text is a place of sounding out, whether it is performed, broadcast, or evoked in the mind's ear. Writing can evoke sounds or soundscapes in the same way it conjures images or landscapes. 
and transcribing sound is key to modernism's synesthetic impulse, and noise in particular tends to the synesthetic, given its relation to touch or to visual overload. But in the words of one critic, modernism has been read and looked at in detail, but rarely heard. The conjunction of literary modernism and sound studies is not thus far a particularly crowded field, and my future research will address something of a gap in each. There has been, however, an explosion of work in the field of sound studies in the past few years. Despite interdisciplinarity being one of the field's watchwords, however, literary culture is given scant attention. Over the last decade or so, my research has been energized by what has come to be called the new modernist studies. Shifts in the field have led to an expanded sense of modernism. We now have a more globalized understanding of early 20th century literary culture and more finely tuned accounts of the relationships between the political and aesthetic commitments of modernist writers. Despite notable exceptions in the work of Sam Halliday and Douglas Kahn, this expansive impulse has yet fully to encompass the sonic dimensions of literary modernism. And more specifically, work on modernism and noise, where it exists, has tended to focus on the avant-garde, that is, on futurism, dada, surrealism. I want to consider a slightly different archive and a differently gendered archive, and I want to think about writers whose engagement with noise emerges from somewhere rather different from the aggressive glorification of war found in futurist poetry. So it's time now to tune into the shifting soundscape of modernist London before considering two modernist noise texts, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, a novel that resonates with the extreme noise of the First World War, and Jean Rhys's short story, Let Them Call It Jazz, a tale of noise disturbance which depicts noise abatement legislation in action. These examples will allow consideration of noise from multiple ordal points as excessive, unwanted, and background sound. Along the way, and drawing on archival material at the Wellcome Institute, I'll give you a taste of the work of the Noise Abatement League, an organization that's received hardly any critical attention, uh, apart from one scholar, James Mansell, whose work I want to acknowledge here. This is also by way of following the arc of my career thus far. Wolf and Rees have been central to my research and teaching for some time now, but I've recently turned to the sonic dimensions of their writing as part of a larger project on interwar noise. So what were the acoustic contours of modernist London? While it is debatable whether volume levels actually increased, given that the noise of horses' hooves blended with and then were replaced by the hum of motor cars, mechanical sounds certainly proliferated. This description from A.H. Davis's book Noise is typical of the period. The irregular rattle of machinery, the shriek of brakes, the crescendo of violently accelerating motorcycles, the shattering explosions of road-breaking drills burst rudely upon our consciousness and stir our resentment and fears. The key obsession of the interwar noise abaters was the motor horn. Never before in the whole raucous history of din have such fiendish contraptions split the air, wrote Dan Mackenzie. Ironically, its increased usage was due to noise reduction in motor vehicles and the dangers resulting from the growing motor car ownership in an environment at various points without speed limits, driver's license, or traffic lights. The introduction of sirens on emergency vehicles and an increase in loudspeakers and amplified sound brought a new pitch and volume to the London soundscape just as the rise in air travel meant surround sound mechanical noise from air as from below ground in the tube. Now I'll play you a, a second sound clip, London Street Sounds. This is from 1928, and it's um, an on-location recording made by the Columbia Graphophone Company in conjunction with the Daily Mail um, noise abatement campaign. This record is being taken in Beacham Place, a side street of Brunton Road, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon of Thursday, the 20th of September, 1928. Here comes the big Florida. <laughs> <coughs> Another big 
While sound recording and telephonic communication have been in existence for decades, the popularization of these technologies, alongside the introduction of professional radio broadcasting in 1922, had a transformative impact on sound levels and where and how listeners experienced them. Domestic soundscapes underwent rapid transformation too, given the prevalence of the gramophone and the wireless and domestic technologies like the Hoover. Modern listeners, then, were practiced in oral streaming or filtering out the din of the machine. Virginia Woolf notes the bewildering noises and shouts of I can't hear you, which were common to telephone communication. These technological shifts were anticipated and impacted on the auditory imagination of modernist writers. The sound theorist Douglas Kahn employs the category of all sound to describe the acoustics of literary modernism. Like a microphone, the text tunes into a full range of acoustic signals, and the modern reader has to filter or decide what to prioritize. One can think about the modernist preoccupation with internal thought, in part as a response to technologies of amplification or auscultation, listening to the sounds of the body. In stream of, conscious writing, stream of consciousness writing, modernists turned up the volume on mental processes, previously inaudible or unrepresented to the human ear. I have come to this project through an interest in urban culture. My research has sought in various ways to offer alternative mappings of modernist London, whether in relation to women's experience or writers who traveled to London from colonial locations in the early 20th century. 
Noise offers an alternative irrespective on the city. It's one of the most obvious ways in which the modern city changed. But hearing is often understood as an unchanging or universalized sense. My concern instead is to historicize hearing. This involves understanding it as a process that varies according to age, class, gender, and race, as well as considering its shifting depictions. One period in which these shifts were particularly marked was during and after the First World War. This takes us then to Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Dalloway, a novel that echoes with the extreme noise of the war. Wolf, like Russelo, was keen to diversify and expand the range of sounds that found their way into her fiction. But as a lifelong pacifist, she had a very different response to the noise of war. Her writing is full of references to sound technologies, the gramophone in between the acts, the telephone in the years. She was interested in the cultural and physical conditions of sound production and reception. And she employs an auditory language of vibration and resonance which references the physics of sound waves as much as the physiological act of hearing. Ever alert to those voices or sounds filtered out as noise, her work embodies an ethics of listening, no more so than in Mrs. Dalloway. The novel is set in 1923 and contains the intriguing pairing of traumatized First World War veteran Septimus Smith and Clarissa Dalloway, married to a conservative MP. The novel offers a trenchant critique of militarized society and connects the codes of masculinity and patriotism that propel men, here a young working class man, to war with the physical, sexual, educational restrictions placed on women, here a middle-aged, upper middle class woman. While writing the novel, Wolfe had re-entered the noisescape of London from Richmond. In her diary, we can see her deliberating on habituation to urban noise and retraining herself orally for life in Tavistock Square. She writes, the habit of living at 52 Tavistock Square is not quite formed, but doing well. Already I've spent a week without being bothered by noise. One ceases to hear or to see. I notice things much less than I did 10 days ago. Soon I shall be making a habit of life in this room. She monitors her own sensitivity to noise and ends up literally reading and writing at the open window, an apt metaphor for the manner in which her work has its ear to the city, open to its noises. She welcomes as well the jolt of sonic disruption, as she was to write later, the shock receiving capacity is what makes me a writer. On one level, Mrs. Dalloway's celebration of London is about sonic diversity, which is registered with a non-discriminating ear. The novel abounds with descriptions like this, the brass bands, the barrel organs, in the triumph and the jingle and the strange high singing of some aeroplane overhead. But this is also in part a novel about war noise. The scale of the cacophony experienced by soldiers was unprecedented. The deafening surround sound of artillery and exploding shells was extreme and caused vibrations forceful enough not just to shock but to shatter eardrums and overwhelm the body's sense organs. War noise was often described as felt rather than heard, and even those on the home front registered the din. In a 1916 essay, Wolfe describes the sinister sound of far-off beating as the noise of war rolls off the bare uplands of the South Downs. Mrs. Dalloway was one of the first novels to represent shell shock, and to use that term, in the wake of the 1922 War Office Committee inquiry into shell shock. In particular, Wolfe explores the medical profession's refusal to hear the traumatized veteran, and the threat of incarceration leads to Septimus's suicide. But a novel about shell shock is inevitably a novel about noise. Initial, de initial definitions of shell shock focused on the organic damage caused by the sound and force of exploding shells. And it was in the interest of the military, of course, to identify a specific cause for war trauma, to treat it, and then return soldiers to the front. War doctor Charles Myers, who was the first to coin the term in 1915, wrote that high-frequency vibrations caused by an exploding shell might, it seemed to me, conceivably produce an invisibly fine molecular commotion in the brain, which in turn might produce dissociation. Neurologist Frederick Mott used brain dissection to attempt to find noise-induced lesions on nerves. 
fairly quickly, more psychologically orientated theories of war trauma enter the frame, especially when doctors realized that many of the men suffering had been nowhere near exploding shells. But the war brought about a renewed interest in neurasthenia, or more specifically, nervous disorders caused by sound. Of course, the extreme noise levels of the contact zone uh, cause physical injury, deafness, burst eardrums, tinnitus. But the sonic legacy of the war was a new understanding of everyday urban din as physically dangerous. Sound was understood as random, uncontrollable, and visceral. Wolfe depicts the auditory culture of modernist London as understood through war noise. Septimus and Clarissa never meet, but have sonic points of connection. The first of these is the noise of an exploding tire. A violent explosion made Mrs. Dalloway jump. Oh, a pistol shot in the street outside. Urban hubbub is registered via the sounds of war, even by civilians. And the narrative enacts the bodily shock through exclamation and interruption. This diary entry provides a clue to the genesis of Mrs. Dalloway's experience. In St. James Street, there was a terrific explosion. People came running out of clubs, stopped still, and gazed about them. But there was no zeppelin or aeroplane, only, I suppose, a very large tire burst. But it is really an instinct with me, and most people, I suppose, to turn any sudden noise or dark object in the sky into an explosion or a German aeroplane. Characters are alert to danger as the memory and anticipation of conflict registers in their ears and the aerial is confused with the terrestrial. In the novel, a sky riding airplane is described like this, the sound of an airplane bored ominously into the ears of the crowd. Again, we get a violent image of materialized sound invading the communal body. This photograph suggests the concern that noise levels in the metropolis would trigger shell shock. This is um, taken in 1914 outside the Charing Cross Hospital. The contextual nature of hearing is also exemplified in the sonic refrain repeated four times in the novel, the chiming of Big Ben that yokes and binds the city dwellers. Given the clock silencing during the second half of the war, its chime is an acoustic reminder of peacetime or the post-war. Wolfe's insistence on the need to hear rather than silence the horrifying noise of war can be found in her description of the chime as leaden circles that dissolved in the air. The sound waves of the peel, peels are materialized as shells, which, although dissolving rather than exploding, act as a reminder of the conflict. The novel also registers what one historian has called a wartime sonic mindedness. The conditions of trench warfare required a hyper alertness to sound, given the reduced vision occasioned by the terrain, the gas, and the barbed wire. Survival depended on hearing. More specifically, it depended on the ability to identify the sounds of different types of explosives, as well as to detect direction and spatial coordinates through sound. Listening, then, was a sense to be trained and honed. In Mrs. Dalloway, we see this kind of auditory hyper-alertness in Septimus. He exhibits auditory hallucinations, hypersensitivity to sound, and synesthesia. Wolf writes, he was always hearing something new, listening with his hand up. He experiences his wife's crying as a piston thumping, and the background noises, like his wife's sewing, are amplified to the extreme. He's constantly attempting to understand or interpret sound rather than be overwhelmed by it. Mrs. Dalloway then registers the aftershocks of the cacophony of war, but also offers a different idea of the sonic, I think. This is one that construes hearing, or the transfer of energy through vibration, as a mode of connection or resonance. Wolf was clearly intrigued by the metaphorical potential of the physics of sound and the physiology of hearing. Her writing abounds with descriptions of hearing that exemplify the process as the physiological transfer of sound waves from a vibrating object to the eardrum and inner ear where fluid vibrations are converted into electrical impulses and onward to the brain. Take a look at this example. Septimus is listening to his neighbor in the crowd sound out the letters um, of an airplane, a sky riding airplane. Septimus heard her say K-R close to his ear, deeply, softly, like a mellow organ, but with a roughness in her voice like a grasshopper's. 
which rasped his spine deliciously and sent running up into his brain waves of sound which concussing broke. A marvelous discovery indeed that the human voice in certain atmospheric conditions can quicken trees into life. Wolf traces the passage of sound waves from vocal mechanism through to the brain. Not only does the reader hear the letters, which are written phonetically, but also the process by which the sonic message is transferred from one body to another. Wolf is also reconfiguring the language of shell shock, which associated sound with bodily injury. Her use of the term concussing indicates this link, as concussion was a key word in wartime descriptions of organic injury from noise. In this passage, sound is physically invasive, but in a pleasurable, spine-tingling way. It is energizing rather than terrifying. And sound doesn't just con connect humans here. Septimus alludes to the impact of sound waves on inanimate matter, the trees, through the phenomenon of sympathetic vibration. One could argue that in Mrs. Dalloway, Wolf hangs the whole notion of paired protagonists who never meet around the idea of sympathetic vibration. But while this is a novel that revels in the connected possibilities of urban sounds, its portrayal of the medical profession contains thinly veiled depictions of those doctors who were busy campaigning against the dangers of noise. In her portrait of Septimus's Harley Street neurologist, William Bradshaw, Wolf is at her most excoriating. His mantra is efficiency and proportion. Anyone deemed transgressive or unfit is subject to silencing or incarceration. Wolf writes, naked, defenseless, the exhausted, the friendless receive the impress of Sir William's will. He swooped, he devoured, he shut people up. The character of Bradshaw is conventionally understood to be based on Sir Maurice Craig, a psychiatrist and nerve specialist who treated Wolf for over two decades. Craig was on the Shell Shock Commission and was also one of the doctors engaged in interwar noise abatement work. In particular, he was part of a 1928 British Medical Association delegation to Parliament to have noise classified as a nuisance under the Public Health Act. Alongside him was Thomas Horder, who would go on to found the Anti-Noise League in 1933. Neville Chamberlain, then Health Minister, was not convinced. He thought the medics were exaggerating and understood response to noise as a function of individual mental health. Although the delegation did not succeed in their aims, this marks a key moment in the late 20s in relation to legislation against noise, a moment that led directly to the founding of the Anti-Noise League. Horder and his colleagues at the Noise Abatement League campaigned endlessly to raise awareness of the dangers of noise, being belligerent about noise, as he put it. Noise complaints rose through the 1930s and the Noise Abatement League laid claim to a range of noise legislation, such as the nighttime banning of the motor horn and various other zoning practices. At the organization's Noise Abatement Exhibition at the Science Museum in 1935, 44,000 visitors were educated in what was called the menace of uncontrolled noise and encouraged to get civilized, keep silent. In his opening address at the exhibition, Horder praised a newly conscious, newly noise conscious nation. There is no need to put up with this stupid expenditure of nerve energy through needless noise than there is to put up with the expenditure caused by bad housing, tainted food, impure water, or any other of the preventable conditions that destroy health. The exhibition showcased new inventions, noise reduction technologies for home and workplace, including silent typewriters, quiet flush toilets, and vacuum cleaners that could be operated around the beds of sleeping hospital patients. The pages of the Noise Abatements magazine Quiet including, uh, included articles on a full range of noise topics, including cinema cacophony, dust carts and light sleepers, and Dogs in Back Gardens by H.G. Wells. This ad for the Barclay restaurant claims to be the only restaurant in Europe from which external noises are excluded. The focus was overwhelmingly on mechanical noise and human control of technology. To quote Horder again, is man to be mutilated by the machines which he's invented? 
He conceded that scientific evidence about the physical effects of urban noise on the body remained inconclusive and instead employed a language of nerve force and entropic decay of energy in the human and national machine. The ear was always the locus of danger. The Noise Abatement League argued that people's bodies and minds were being bombarded and depleted by invisible waves in the ether, and they saw it as their job to educate and inform. And just to go back again to the logo with its alliterative slogan, it's interesting to note here, I think, the clear, the clear target victim based on the image, professional man with the huge head, the pressure point in the brain, um, the mind overwhelmed by sound and sense data. So in effect, sort of man unable to, to exist in the city. The solution proposed repeatedly by the Noise Abatement League was public education in sonic self-regulation. The narrative of catastrophe and decline so prevalent in the 1930s could be reversed through teaching people to be quieter. I have this repeated phrase of needless or unnecessary noise. The Noise Abatement League's doctors focused on the impact of noise on the body, heart rate and metabolism, but the language quickly shifted to an interwar vocabulary of efficiency and behavior, as in Mrs. Dalloway. This became more insistent as the 1930s progressed. To quote Horder again, as never before does this nation need cool judgment, steady nerves, and reserves of force. Noise is an indicator then of other interwar social and political anxieties. One contributor to Quiet writes, efficient, hard-working, successful people are not noisy or boisterous. Another, noise is useless, it does no good, it's a parasite, and all parasites ought to be wiped out. Horder's presidency of the Eugenic Society coincided with his chairmanship of the Noise Abatement League, and you don't have to look too far before encountering a classist language of selective breeding. The Noise Abatement League's phrase, acoustic civilization, encapsulates the regulation of, in particular, a rising middle class described as primitive and immature citizens. Noise was not just a byproduct of modernity, but to quote one contributor, the result of thoughtlessness, selfishness, and stupidity, a sign of lingering savagery. The needless noisemaker will be an outlaw from sober and intelligent society. The Noise Abatement League was affiliated with the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, and this is also about control of the countryside and sites seen as refuge places from urban din. Horder's particular scapegoat was the sports car driver with his flamboyant exhaust, suede shoes, and marcelled hair. A language of acoustic nationalism or the creation of a silent, docile nation emerges in this period in relation to other ways of narrating Britishness. It originates out of a post-war context of extreme sound, but in other ways, noise is merely a provocative metaphor for other anxieties. Also, I think about the new medium of radio and think of the Rethian control of the airwaves, um, but that's, that's another, another talk. In the mid-30s, the Noise Abatement League's goal was bizarrely an all-silent London by 1940, a goal which was eclipsed by the onset of the Second World War. Now I want to move slightly beyond the interwar to a period in which noise abatement in Britain was bound up more overtly with questions of race and cultural identity. Noise-making as an attention and space-claiming practice tells us about histories of exclusion and protest. But to designate sound or speech noise is to silence and dismiss. As one theorist of noise writes, in noise can be read the codes of life, the relations among men. And I would add to that between men and women, if we think of the history of modes of silencing women's voices and bodies and how often noise is central to definitions of women as somehow aberrant or monstrous. The Dominican writer Jean Rees's story, Let Them Call It Jazz, was published in 1962 in the London magazine but was written in 1949 in the immediate aftermath of Windrush and the context of the 1949 Immigration Act. This is a story about noise making as cultural expression as well as the sonic dimensions of racism. It's also, strangely, a story in which we see the effects of noise abatement legislation. Reese's writing in general is preoccupied with the social conditions in which sound is produced, received and silenced. Musical allusions abound in Reese's interwar novels, which operate as sonic collages, 
punctured as they are by street criers, performers, memories of Franco and Anglophone Caribbean folk songs, popular song lyrics from the music hall. She was well acquainted with Dominican and Martinican folk song as a mode of cultural expression and resistance, as we'll see, but as a white Creole writer, she was also at a remove from a straightforward identification with protest song or the music of carnival. So too, her cultural difference was orally rather than visually defined. She was asked to leave Rada, for example, and told that her nasty sing-song voice would stand in her way. And her biographer notes that she whispered throughout her life as though to somehow hide her voice. Let Them Call It Jazz is Reese's only story with a black female protagonist, Martinique and Selena Davis. The story tells of Selena's move to a South London suburb after eviction from a flat in Notting Hill. The area's supposed respectability is signaled by a lack of noise. The quiet neighbors stare as if I'm wild animal. Selena starts livening up the place by singing her grandmother's Martinican folk songs, claiming the space inside the flat and then outside through sound. Selena's rendition of Don't Trouble Me Now, a song about the building of the Panama Canal, both in content and decibel level, troubles her white bourgeois neighbors. The police are called. Selena is arrested, tried, and sent to Holloway Prison when she can't pay the fine. Excess noise is, of course, also about excess bodies. The sound is embodied and inextricable from the sight of the black woman and dismissed as noise or interference. While in prison, Selena hears a woman singing a song of defiance, the Holloway song. Later, out of prison, a man hears her whistling the song, jazzes it up and sells it. He sends her five pounds, her share of the profit. On one level, the story is an allegory of colonialism in the sense that colonized cultural forms are silenced initially, then co-opted for financial or cultural profit. But it's also about the excessive properties of sound or the way sound or noise spills over and resists co-option or commodification. Selena says of the Holloway song, it don't fall down and die in the courtyard, seems to me it could jump the gates of the jail easy and travel far and nobody could stop it. Here we are back, although in a different context, to the physical impact or force of sound. Rhys clearly has sorrow songs in mind, as well as a specific song of escape, the African-American spiritual Joshua Fit the Battle of Jericho, in which the force of trumpet sound brings the walls down. But given that the story takes place in a women's prison, famous for incarcerating suffragettes, the song of slavery fuses with suffragette anthems, perhaps even Ethel Smy's March of the Women, a suffragette anthem which was performed in Holloway Prison. Throughout her fiction, Rhys refuses the figure of the English woman, defined by silence and stillness. And here she braids together different traditions of resistant noise making and noise abatement. But the tale also plays with conventional understandings of sound as somehow pure or transcendent. The idea that sound will jump the gates or that it belongs to or expresses Selena's suffering. When the song is jazzed up, Selena is distraught. That song was all I had. I don't belong nowhere, really. When that girl sing, she sing to me and she sing for me. Now I've let them play it wrong and it will go from me like all the other songs. Then she thinks, all this is foolishness. Even if they played it on trumpets like I wanted, no walls would fall. Sound seems then to have the potential to escape commodification or to be the place where identity resides before it falls back into culture and back into transcription. The story is written in Creole, voiced in what Rhys called stylized patois, which she remembered by ear and memory. Sound is bound up then with its inscription. It is understood or heard through narrative. Noise, however you parse it, takes us to sonic materiality. Attending to the acoustics of literary modernism is not just about registering new soundscapes and ways of hearing and making sound, although it is about that, but also about the way sound connects and regulates bodies. 
and the noise scapes of literary modernism are all the more cacophonous when heard alongside the biopolitics of the Noise Abatement League's attempts to create a quiet citizenry. If you would indulge me in one final example, I want to end by turning back to Wolfe, partly because I always come back to her writing, but also to take a listen to what I, might, I think might be her noisiest novel, Between the Acts. Set on the eve of the Second World War in a rural English village, this final unfinished novel play was written during the conflict. Her house in London had been bombed and she and her husband Leonard were living in rural Sussex with the fear of Nazi invasion from the South Coast. Throughout the 1930s, she'd been researching and writing about the causes and effects of the rise of fascism, both on the continent and in Britain. In ways that speak very much to our own moment, Wolf had been thinking about countering exclusion reforms of national belonging. And we might remember the quotation from Three Guineas, 1938, as a woman, I have no country, as a woman, my country is the whole world, particularly resonant at the moment. With Between the Acts, she was writing the nation as a heterogeneous space by representing it as a noisescape. In the novel, the British countryside is a place buzzing with sound, not extreme sound, but background, half heard, inaudible sound. At the center of the novel is to use Wolfe's phrase, a gigantic ear attached to a gigantic head, a kind of radio receiver picking up signals without privileging or filtering. The text is full of all manner of voices, gossiping, discussing, interrupting, overheard by the reader in snippets and fragments. At the end of a decade when organizations like the Society for Rural Preservation and the affiliated Noise Abatement League had defined the nation through its quiet rural spaces under threat from noisy foreigners or the rowdy lower classes, Wolf writes a novel about rural commotion. We couldn't be further from C.F. Masterman's nostalgia in his book, The Heart of Empire, for a still quiet old England and his sense that in the noisy boisterousness of the modern English crowd is revealed the ravages of the disease of modern life. But the novel also goes beyond the human and amplifies the noise of the natural world. The land itself is given voice in a kind of acoustic ecology. She writes, every sound in nature was painfully audible. The drone of the trees was in their ears, the chirp of birds and other incidents of garden life. Hearing and the associated processes of resonance and reverberation become an alternative model of meaning making in the face of fascist uniformity. Everything is vibrating in the novel, resonating, humming, in motion, in noise. One of the pleasures of, uh, rather overwhelming pleasures, but pleasures of an occasion like this is the way it gathers people from different places and times in one's life and offers an, offers an opportunity for some public thank yous. But I want to start by pausing to remember someone who would have been an honored guest here tonight, but very sadly died last month after a long illness, Professor David Bradshaw. David was a scholar and editor of modernism and his wonderful editions of Wolfe's novels, including Mrs. Dalloway, demonstrate how incredibly attuned his critical ear was to Wolfe's cadences and rhythms and their engagement with the historical moment. His work had a profound impact on me, as I know it did on many in this room, and he is deeply, deeply missed. I absolutely would not be standing here tonight were it not for the support of my family and friends, especially from my parents, from Dominic, and from my very own joyful noisemakers in the second row, <laughs> who've been very quiet. I've been at King's now for over a decade, and I'm constantly reminded what a pleasure it is to work in the English department here, surrounded by such thoughtful and convivial colleagues. The final thanks goes to my students, undergraduate, postgraduate, past and present, many are here tonight. Teaching at King's is a humbling and enlivening experience. I want to close now with a last passage from Between the Acts, though, and a return to the festival theme of play, but to turn that into word play. Not only does Wolfe depict a particular kind of soundscape in the novel, but she becomes ever more attentive to the noise of words themselves. At a moment when language was at its most instrumental, 
required to sit still in the interests of wartime propaganda, she portrays words transforming and metamorphosing, echoing across sentences and through time and the text is a sort of collage of misremembered often, hence living quotations. Here we have a murmuration of starlings. The whole tree hummed with the whiz they made as if each bird plucked a wire. A whiz, a buzz rose from the bird buzzing, bird vibrant, bird blackened tree. The tree became a rhapsody, a quivering cacophony, a whiz and vibrant rapture. Branches, leaves, birds, syllabling discordantly, life, life, life. The passage does what it describes. The commotion of the birds is transferred to the undulations and sonic patterning of the prose. The energy emanates from the page in the repetition, metamorphosis, and accretion of sounds, words, and phrases. For Wolf, literature is that place where words slip and slide, not to persuade, but to provoke. A place of unresolvability, of contestation, a place to think, see, or hear differently. If literature is the noise of culture, it is more important than ever to listen in to its unpredictable frequencies. Thank you all so much for coming and listening. Okay. Um, some years ago, uh, when it seemed as if every train carriage was full of people shouting into their mobile phones, I developed a diatribe against this new sound technology. I was, like Horner of the Anti-Noise League, belligerent again about sound. I was indeed the commandant of the self-appointed commandant of the Quiet Coach. Mobile phone use was, I said, killing off inner speech that dialogue of the self with the self that sustains identity. I only stopped delivering my little homily when I read an article making exactly the same point, but this time it was from the 1920s, and its author was fulminating against the radio. Among many other terms for thinking, Anna's lecture tonight helps us to historicize sound and noise, the differences between sound and noise. It's opened up a history of noises detractors, as well as those celebrating the sounds of modern life. These include not only the avant-garde with their promotion of an art of noise, but those modernist writers, notably Wolfe and Jean Rees, for whom the sounds, the noisescape of city and country serve as modes of connection rather than alienation. The lecture has put the literary text together with the history, culture, politics and sciences of sound in the most fascinating and illuminating ways, the extraordinary Anna's extraordinary ear for language. I know we'll all look forward with keen anticipation uh, to the publications and other, other collaborative works that will emerge from this wonderful research. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking again Professor Anna Snaith for her wonderful talk and to congratulate her on all the achievements that have led to this evening's event and celebration. <laughs>